Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Mary Catherine, and I am the Information Outreach Specialist here at the Foreign Press Center. Uh, thank you all for being here for what I think is going to be a most timely discussion. Uh, today we're pleased to host uh, Roll Call's Editor-in-Chief, Melinda Hedenberger, for a conversation on how down-ticket races, so those of lesser um, prestige, I guess, uh, will be influenced by the presidential race. Uh, as I mentioned, Melinda is the Editor-in-Chief for Roll Call, a leading uh, provider of congressional and legislative news. Uh, before joining Roll Call, Melinda worked as a writer for publications such as the New York Times, Bloomberg Politics, and the Washington Post. She has also served as a fellow for institutions such as Harvard University and Catholic University. And if you'd like to learn more about her, there are bios available at the sign-in table. Um, one quick note before we get started, I'd just like to recognize CQ Roll Call. Uh, as some of you might know, this is our fourth uh, briefing with them and a series of briefings, and we just really would like to uh, recognize how much we appreciate their making experts like Melinda available to us and available to you guys. Um, so thanks to, to CQ Roll Call for that. Um, and at this point, I think some of you know the drill. I'd like to ask all of you to silence your cell phones. Uh, feel free to use them to take pictures, to live tweet, whatever you'd like to do, but we just ask that they remain silent for the duration of the program. Um, and one final note, I'd like to remind you that the views represented here are those of the speaker, Melinda, and not of the US government, so <laughs> a big disclaimer. And with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Melinda to the podium. Thank you very much for coming today and for having me. Um, so I have been covering politics since 1988 for various publications. No one has ever seen a year like this in American politics. So when we say, and I, are most of you covering the presidential election? Right. So, you know, there have been a lot of um, assumptions made about how things would go this year. All of those have been proven false. So when I'm asked to say, oh, how is the presidential race going to affect the down ticket races, so especially the Senate and the House races, I should really first say that no, anyone who says they know that answer is not really telling, they're either deluded or not telling you the truth. Um, but there is, of course, the widespread assumption that this could be that Trump at the top of the Republican ticket could be very harmful could uh, for the party, could um, have a, a high likelihood of turning the Senate back over to the Democrats. The Republicans can only lose three Senate seats. There are 10 in play. They can only lose three Senate seats and keep their majority. So when we look at the highly contested races, and there are a bunch of them, it's, it's probably most likely, again, although anything can happen in politics and does, um, it's most likely that the balance in the Senate is going to swing to the Democrats. Um, and I'll go through some of these um, most exciting races in a minute. In the House, in the House of Representatives, no one has, has thought that Democrats ha really had any true chance of taking back the House. It's really just in the last, I'd say, week or so when people have said it still is difficult. Structurally, it's quite difficult because of gerrymandering, because of redistricting. It's structurally set up now so that it would be hard for the Republicans to lose. But for the first time, people really are saying it's doable. This could happen now. They would have to flip 30 seats. That's an awful lot of seats, especially place, you know, many of those seats lean Republican. I've heard people say, people who, who look at these races for a living say, 10 is possible, 20 is in, not crazy, 30 is, is a stretch for sure, but the place that Democrats think they can might be able to pull this off is in mostly suburban districts that are changing. So um, I, I think that we say this every election, but it will never be more true than this election that women voters will tell the story 
both at the top of the ticket and down ticket. And that's because uh, Donald Trump's favorables with women are quite low. Um, and with Hillary Clinton as the nominee, this really is going to be not just a battle of the sexes, but um, some of the top issues in the race. And again, those top issues at the top of the ticket are going to filter down to the local level because increasingly the House and Senate races are nationalized, by which I mean the, the issues that are, that are argued every single day at the top of the ticket are what people vote on locally as well. Um, the Republicans, anyway, to finish my thought, those, those are going to be over things like equal pay. They're going to be over what we have. I don't, I don't know for sure that there is such a thing as women's issues. All issues are women's issues. But that conversation about gender, especially given a lot of the statements that Donald Trump has made, is going to be front and center in this election. So how do vulnerable Republicans handle that is going to be very interesting. So we sent out reporters yesterday to ask all those vulnerable Republicans, so are you endorsing the nominee of your party? Uh, we got some different answers, of course. Um, Kelly Ayotte in New Hampshire, who's in a very tight race with the governor of her state, Maggie Hassan. She's up four points, but it's really going to be a, a very tight race. She said, yes, yeah, she'll support the nominee, but like a lot of other Republicans, she'd rather not say the name of the nominee. Now, of course, her opponent is already talking about the Trump IAT ticket. And that's what we're hearing all over the country with Democrats are using uh, some of Trump's statements against the Senate candidates. Um, some examples, um, okay, so in, um, in Wisconsin, where Ron Johnson is one of the most endangered Republicans in the Senate, running against the Democrat Russ Feingold, who served in the Senate for 18 years. So already Ron Johnson is saying, well, you know, I'll support the nominee, but I'm focused on Wisconsin. I'm not focused on, you know, on the top of the ticket. Uh, and the um, so Russ Feingold's campaign is already saying, oh, does Ron Johnson believe that women who want abortion should be put in jail? So that's the kind of thing um, we're going to be hearing everywhere, you know. Um, Kelly Ayotte's people saying, you know, she doesn't plan to endorse anyone, which is kind of funny because anyone, like, oh, who would it be that she would endorse? Of course she would only endorse one person, Donald Trump. So there's going to be, and already is, all this Republican running away from the top of the ticket. However, they're also in a difficult position, complicated position, because they don't want to speak out against the nominee and alienate a lot of their own voters who really feel obviously very strongly about this guy. Um, so I'm just going to run through the top six races that I think, the, the Senate races, that um, really could go either way. In Ohio, Rob Portman, who's the Republican incumbent, is up against um, the former governor, Ted Strickland. And this is a dead heat at this point, 38 to 38. Um, Portman just said yesterday, I'll, I'll endorse the nominee unless something crazy happens. You know, like if something crazy hasn't already happened, I don't know how he would define crazy. Um, North Carolina, uh, again, a virtual tie. Um, the incumbent, Richard Burr, is up by four points over a virtual unknown, Rebecca Ross, who was uh, not the first choice of her party to run, a state re uh, representative. She worked for the ACLU for many years, which is not exactly necessarily a plus in a conservative state like North Carolina. And yet she's, she's and in a state that leans Republican, she's neck and neck with them. 
Um, another one that's a complete toss-up is uh, in Pennsylvania, where the incumbent Pat Toomey is up against Katie McGinty, who just won a very hotly contested primary over Joe Sestak. She is considered a weak candidate. She um, was was the choice of the establishment because Sestak was considered such a loose cannon and someone who couldn't be told what to do. And Democrats were really complaining, this is our choice. You know, we're putting all this money into Katie McGinty. And yet she's, she, again, is neck and neck with the incumbent, Pat Toomey, which does not look good for the Republican Party. Um, I already talked about Ron Johnson and Russ Feingold in Wisconsin and the New Hampshire race. In Illinois, um, it, the incumbent Mark Kirk uh, is trailing Tammy Duckworth, a congresswoman uh, from Illinois, by about six points. And so that's one that, that there are, any, again, anything can happen, but he's uh, probably the most endangered Republican. Um, in the House, they're just, in all of these, there are probably 25 seats that are truly in play. Uh, and again, the Democrats would have to get 30. So it would have to be a complete tidal wave for uh, Democrats to take back the House. But this year, that's not totally out of the question. So um, tell me what your questions are, what you're wondering about. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you mentioned issues going down the ticket, um, and and then talk about some women's issues and so. On. Um, but I'm interested in whether uh, an issue such as esoteric, perhaps, as um, judicial appointments, mm. uh, which I think the chattering class believes is a hugely important issue in this election, can that affect the down ticket campaign, or is it just too hard to articulate? I think that that is a big deal uh, in the presidential race on both sides with because Hillary Clinton is perceived, I think, correctly as having as being a candidate with a lot of weaknesses, too, or we wouldn't have seen the strength of of Bernie Sanders that we're still seeing. Um, so at the top of the ticket on both sides, you're going to hear Democrats arguing you know, okay, even if you don't like Hillary, do you want to see Donald Trump's Supreme Court and vice versa? Down since, since that it's not up to Congress to decide that, although, of course, the balance in the Senate does make it up, but I, I, think, that's, I think that's maybe one turn too many for people to make down ticket. I'm not sure it will turn on that so much as it will on trying to tie, as I said before, in commercials and on the stump, trying to tie the, the Republicans who are running to anti-Muslim sentiment, anti-woman sentiment, Mexicans, all, all the various comments that Trump has made. Um, and, and people really like to have a divided government. That's the other thing is that I think people, Americans in general, feel very comfortable having the checks and balances that, that have, having different branches of government controlled by different parties brings. Mm -hmm. Can I just have you say your name and your outlet? Sure. Know. I'm Juliano Basili from Valor Economic. It's a Brazilian financial newspaper. I'm just wondering, uh, if you are a Republican Congress and you need to be reelected, what should be your strategy? Uh, are you going to take the Trump train? Are you going to support Hillary? Or are you going to play as an independent? You're definitely not going to uh, support Hillary. At least no one knows what you do in the, in the voting booth. But you're not going to come out for the Democratic nominee, I really don't think. You can, you'll probably try to run away from the question. You'll probably do as many are doing, saying, of course I support my party. And, you know, remember when Sharon Angle, who was running in Nevada, literally ran away from reporters on camera? I think you may see some of that. I think people are really not going to want to be 
tied to Trump, but neither can they say, I don't think very many of them will say this is, would be really bad for the republic because they fear the backlash from their own people. So they're in a pickle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm Jan from German Public Radio. You're mentioning people have doing awkward endorsements for Trump. Are there candidates really jumping onto the Trump train and really embracing him? Mostly not. I mean, I, there have been a couple who have, well, look at John McCain, okay? I mean, John McCain, here we have a man who was one of the first people to have been disrespected by Donald Trump very publicly, saying, I, I don't like uh, people who were captured, okay? You know, to someone who, I mean, we would have thought and did think that you could not say that in the Republican Party and survive. And here is John McCain, who is the antithesis of Donald Trump on every conceivable level, and who disagrees with them to the extent that we know what Donald Trump's positions are, who disagrees with him very strongly, especially on national security, saying he endorses him. So now that I'm sure it's the weakest possible endorsement, but in his state, because immigration is such a big issue in Arizona, I think he's one who can't afford to run away as fully as we think he would love to. So. I'm Marcel Kelfer with Radio Canada. But in today's papers, he's quoted behind closed doors, McCain saying, Trump's gonna hurt him because of the Hispanic population in his state. So he endorsed him, but at the same time is thinking, oh, I'm going to have a hard time. He's he says that he's in the base of his life because it's Trump. Oh, he, he certainly is. That's, that's what I mean. That's, that's, that's the tension. I mean, we did a piece a week ago saying, our, our columnist Patricia Murphy saying, Trump has fenced in McCain. He's made it very difficult for him because he can't come out against him, but neither can he embrace him because they're, you know, the, the feelings are so high on both sides. I think that probably McCain will survive this race, but a lot can happen, obviously, between now and the election, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, Keith Vogt with Canadian Broadcasting. So just to be devil's advocate, what is the evidence that Trump is wrong when he says he's going to uh, redraw the electoral map and that Republicans will win in places that they haven't won in decades? And, you know, I, I am playing devil's advocate there. <laughs> but but is, have you looked at this question to see whether there's any truth to that at all? Well, we don't. We don't know, and it, it's in a sense unknowable, but I'm not someone who rules out a Trump victory. I know that a lot of Democrats feel that this is going to be a landslide. I, I, think it, I think that Clinton could lose. That doesn't mean she's going to lose, obviously, but I think it's true that he, can, he, Trump, can pull Democratic votes especially because she's not so popular in all quarters, both among, um, among the, the liberal wing of her party, but also um, some of the you know, more conservative Democrats, and there still are some, even if they're not well represented in Congress. So I think that you know, the old, like, what used to be Reagan Democrats, to the extent there are any of those left in the Democratic Party, I, I think that's the kind of person Trump could, Trump could pull. And we've just never seen a candidate quite like him who has succeeded on this level. So we don't know, but because, also because he's such a chameleon. I mean, you know, if you, if you hear him, and he's not talking about immigration that day, he can sound like a Democrat. I mean, he says, don't touch Social Security. He says, we have to take care of people, you know, on the health care front. He says, uh, protectionism, which appeals to a lot, of, uh, a lot of union members, I could see 
feeling that, you know, he's going to, when he promises he's going to bring all these jobs back, I'm, I'm not sure how he thinks he can unilaterally reverse globalization, but those promises appeal to a lot of people. So we don't know. When you put together um, the protectionist, isolationist impulses with the kind of moderate, even democratic sounding promises, plus the, I won't even call them dog whistles to racism, xenophobia, misogyny, that appeal to another kind of person, I don't, I don't know. It, it's, it's possible, I think. New York, go ahead, please. Okay, hi, Igor Borisenko with the Task Russian Agency. Uh, with the Trump representative nominee, what about the magic number 1237? How important would be the allocation of the votes uh, during the next uh, uh, primaries? Uh, what, and actually, could you shed some light how the uh, allocation would happen when Trump is the only runner, actually? Well, those uh, Californians were so excited that they were going to get to matter for once, and now they don't. So um, really, the primaries are over now, I think, on both sides. Um, there, there, of course, is a difference in that in the Democratic Party, not only is Bernie Sanders staying in, but he is, his goal at this point is obviously to influence the platform, influence Hillary Clinton, try to continue to keep her to the left. Uh, whereas on the right, since Reince Priebus has said he's the presumptive nominee and the other two candidates, Cruz and Kasich, have dropped out, it, we're done. I mean, I, I can't imagine now a scenario in which there's an open, contested, brokered convention. So no, the primaries going forward really don't matter. I'm sorry to say. And I think that this election has shown a lot of light on how, what a jumble our whole system of primaries and caucuses is. I mean, I have a college-age daughter who just voted in the caucuses in Colorado, and what she describes is, was just a mess. Uh, and you hear this in so many uh, situations in these caucuses, where, you know, in, in her voting place, she said it was complete pandemonium, and at the last minute, they shouted out, if you're not in your corners in five minutes, your vote doesn't count. So there was a stampede, and then they heard the next day, well, those votes aren't even binding. So she was quite, and I was sorry, of course, because you want your, your children to become, you know, to have a sense of civic responsibility and to vote and to feel that your vote matters. And she said, you know, they announced the next day that, so I did that for, I went around and was in this stampede and I was there for three hours for nothing. So there is that sense this year because I think because on the Republican side that there was all this uncertainty about an open convention and whether the vote, whether the popular vote would really count for much. And on the Democratic side, all this new uh, renewed attention on the superdelegates and, you know, is on both sides, the question was, is the system rigged? And the answer is yes, the parties control the system, but um, I think this year has started a, a big conversation about how both parties might want to reform the process because they were so criticized this year, and I think rightly so. Yeah, I heard an, an analysis at CNN that Trump needs to, to turn only four states. It's like he, he needs to keep the same result, uh, the same results as 2012, and he only needs to, to turn out like uh, Ohio, Wisconsin, Illinois, or maybe Michigan. So 
uh, what do you think it's going to be his strategy? Is he going to, to try to make alliance with politicians over there? Or his strategy is going to, to be uh, the one to make national speeches and gather as most uh, voters as he can? I don't think he's going to be going for the endorsements of politicians. We see what happened in Indiana, for example, with the governor there, Mike Pence, endorsing Cruz, and no one cared. Uh, and that's very much in line with the feeling, the anti-establishment feeling this year. So I think Donald Trump will be Donald Trump. And the funny thing is that even though he says he's not a typical politician, he has a different position depending on who he's talking to, sometimes several different ones in any given day, which is very much a typical politician. So I think we will see Donald Trump be Donald Trump, maybe a little toned down in terms of taking on every group in the world, but we're definitely going to see some very over-the-top attacks on Hillary Clinton and she on him as well. So, you know, I, I don't know if he has sent back the wedding gift they gave him, the Clintons gave him, but, I mean, this is really going to be a very nasty battle. I think that he will, I think he'll do the thing that, again, is very typical, which is try to appeal to racial fears and um, to people who feel that people are coming in from elsewhere and getting a free ride and taking their jobs. And then when he's criticized for that, he'll say, oh, no, those are my best, you know, Mexicans are my best friends. And uh, whoever he's just attacked, they're his best friends. So he'll say both things and try to appeal, of course, to, to all. Should we take one from New York, please? From uh, Slovenian Press Agency. Uh, before you said uh, he's a kind of a chameleon, uh, Donald Trump, right? So we can expect that he's going to be moving to the middle uh, during the general campaign. But uh, how do you think that's going to play with, with social conservatives in the Republican Party? I mean, uh, is the hatred or fear of Hillary Clinton be stronger motivator than, uh, I don't know, <laughs> the feeling of betrayal of Trump when he switches position on, I don't know, abortion, things like that? I think that social conservatives are ha have been very upset about Donald Trump for a really long time. Those were his biggest critics uh, within the Republican Party. And I think they have already lost the argument uh, for this cycle within their party. I mean, Donald Trump is not a national security conservative. He's not a social conservative. And he's not an economic conservative. And the majority of Republicans said they did not care. Now, uh, <laughs> so, but social conservatives above all, because as you say, he's had several different uh, opinions on abortion. And I, I, most social conservatives I know don't believe that he is, don't believe him when he says he's pro-life. Uh, don't even, you know, he did not even know that it's not a pro-life position to say that women who have an abortion should go to jail. Uh, he had to be told that because he, he came across very much as someone who's never really thought about that issue much one way or the other, even though he says he's on all sides of it. So I, we ran an interesting story the other day before the Indiana election that showed some anti-Trump messages. It was um, a survey that looked at people who had seen certain anti-Trump ads and how they voted versus people who had not seen the ads. So it's not asking people, what will you do, but it's measuring the actual behavior, how they did vote after seeing that or not seeing that. So there's a control group. And it found that men who support Trump could not be dissuaded by any anti-Trump ad in a, any anti-Trump information. Women could be dissuaded, uh, especially powerful for them were those ads you probably have seen with the women just saying all the things that, some of the things that Donald Trump has said about women over the years. 
Um, but when you say, well, women can be moved, then you say, what women? So few women are, I mean, that's Donald Trump's um, big problem is women voters and minority voters. Um, I mean, back to your question, you were saying, you know, how to, if they only have to win four states, four more states, but that means they have to keep what they had before, whereas I would be shocked if Donald Trump does as well with Hispanics even as Mitt Romney did, and as we know, that was very poorly. So, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I just, just want, I, I think my point was, uh, it was a long question, uh, do you see a social conservative, do you see any danger of them staying at home, not coming to the, to the polling places? Very yes, much uh, so. Very. I mean, in recent days, I've heard Republicans say they're not voting because they couldn't possibly vote for either candidate. And I've also uh, heard some Republicans say they would vote for Hillary Clinton. Some serious Republicans. I mean, Mark Salter, who for years was a top aide to John McCain and, and you know, helped him write his books, uh, has said he's, he put on Twitter, I'm with her. You know, so you are seeing some very serious uh, conservatives saying that they would prefer to see Hillary Clinton. Uh, I mean, that's tough to measure at this point, right? Uh, and also remember that in '08, right after the right after Barack Obama won the nomination over Hillary Clinton, a lot of Clinton supporters said, "I'll never vote for Barack Obama. I'll stay home or I'll vote for the Republican rather than vote for him because feelings were so raw." And in the end, almost all of them did vote for Obama. So we don't, you know, it's early and and. We don't know how he's going to be reaching out. Um, like I heard Mark Levin, conservative uh, radio host, last night saying, you know, he's got to convince me that this wouldn't be a dis the disaster I think it would be. I'm open to it, but I'm unconvinced. And I think that's where a lot of conservatives are. Mm hmm Thank you once again. Uh, talking about the elections for, for the Congress, uh, seeing Trump's success with a special kind of voters, do you think the other uh, candidates can harvest this, this success? They can be on the Trump train and be Trump's guy? Or is it so special people only like Trump and they wouldn't, don't care about the other ones? I think if, if, we're, if we're wrong that it hurts Republicans, in other words, if Trump does better than we think he might, national, if, if, it's, if there is a Trump train, then of course that, that would help Republicans down ticket. Um, and there are places, especially the House races, where those Republicans will, in, in very Republican-leaning districts or even slightly red districts, would, I'm sure, feel very comfortable supporting him and where there's no dissonance at all. Um, where I'm from, in a very small town in southern Illinois, that is um, very conservative, even though Illinois is a blue state, it's, um, I'm from one of seven counties that went for Alan Keyes over Barack Obama in the Senate race, if that tells you how conservative. You know, I'm sure that's Trump country, right? Mm -hmm. Just to follow up, but you just explained that Trump isn't really conservative. He's more is a, it really a conser con conservative uh -huh. candidate? He is. He's more sounds more democratic. So perhaps some of your neighbors would say, "No, I don't like this guy because he is not in my value range." Or something you would like that. think that, and yet so far that hasn't hurt him with Republicans. A cert I mean, I think that. So you have like the National Review Republicans, right? I mean, the more like intelligent, the elite Republicans who are appalled, uh, people who have maybe worked in the Republican Party who are very upset. And then you have the rank and file, and, and they're all over the map, so I don't wanna say there's any one feeling that they have, but the most probably surprising thing about Donald Trump is how impervious his supporters are to learning that his views don't mesh with theirs. 
at at so I was covering Trump before I took my current job. I was that's what I was doing, and I would say to people at these rallies, "Are do you consider yourself a conservative? Yes. <coughs> do you consider yourself a strong conservative? Yes. Uh, if you take." immigration out of the equation, what did you just hear him say that was conservative? I literally had no people who could tell me something he had. Well, I think he's very pro-military, but he said we shouldn't have gone into Iraq. But he said we should be so strong that we never have to go to war. Well, but I think he, you know, he's really for the vets. I just feel that. You know, there was nothing, and yet that did not make them feel that he wasn't their guy, on the contrary. Voting is so emotional. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One's a quick, I heard Norm Ornstein, for whom I have a lot of respect, say yesterday Trump starts with a base of 45 to 46 percent. What do you think of those numbers? Oh, gosh. I, I mean, I can't take on Norm's numbers. Sure, I, I think it's, it's very difficult to know, but he starts, they both start with um, such high unfavorables that that makes it unpredictable too in terms of how many people are going to stay home or cross over. You know, some people, it, it goes the other way too. We've mostly talked about suppressing the conservative vote, but there are also Democrats who even against Donald Trump won't, won't vote for Hillary Clinton. I suspect that number is smaller than the Republicans who won't vote for Trump, but we don't know that. Hmm. So. Also, um, my understanding is that typically once the pivot happens from the primary campaign to the jail or election campaign, then the campaign structure of the candidate who's the nominee moves over to the election um, structure. But that there is noise that that won't happen this time or that there will be resistance to that this time on the Republican side. Can you talk about that? I mean, is it really possible somebody else will run Trump's campaign that he would let that? Or on the, from the other point of view, is it really possible the Republicans would let him run his own campaign? I don't think there, when it comes to Donald Trump, I don't think there's any letting involved. I think no matter what they do, he's gonna be himself because he can't do otherwise. And I think he will end up running his own campaign no matter who's officially in charge of it. So, uh, and you have to say, he's been a lot savvier than the establishment he's run against. So why should, on that level, why should he turn it over to a bunch of people who have completely lost, so lost the faith of their party that some of the pro-Trump feeling is you hear people say again and again, my party has lied to me, my party has disappointed me. If Donald Trump doesn't agree with me on everything, I say let's blow it up. So there's really that anger. Yes. Okay. Hi. Uh, what is your opinion about the younger voters and the independent voters? How these groups can vote in November, in your opinion? The younger voters and the? Independents. Independents. Um, that's one place, the independent votes, because independents couldn't vote in a lot of these primaries that, you know, I, I, my guess is that a lot of them would support Clinton over Trump, but again, you know, that's, that's really to be seen. I think with younger voters, um, I saw an awful, all I can say is, I saw more younger voters out supporting Trump than I did Clinton. Now, of course, most of the young people were over at the Sanders rallies. Um, so we'll see when it comes to the general what happens. Um, but I don't know that younger voters will turn, I don't think younger voters will turn out for Hillary they, the way they would have for Bernie 
especially when you hear them saying, you know, we're in this movement with or without the Democratic Party. So that same thing I just said, that feeling of, you know, my party has lied to me, let's blow it up. There's that feeling on the in the Democratic Party as well, which is why you see the strength of Sanders, and especially from young people. Did you have a question? Yeah, sorry for my pronunciation. My first question is, that, do you think the deep division created by Mr. Trump during the primaries will remain after the election, even Mr. Trump is elected? Another question is that uh, last month, uh, Mr. Ari Flesser, an advisor to former President Bush, he said that if Trump wins the nomi nominee, the nomination of the party, the definition of Republic Party, Republican Party will be rewritten. How do you think about the definition has been rewritten or not? Well, Michael Reagan, the former president's um, son, said, tweeted the other day that uh, the Reagan Republicanism is dead. Reagan, uh, you know, the Reagan's Republican party is, is finished. And I know that a lot of people do feel that way, that the party, that Trump is already completely redefining the party. Um, then you hear other Republicans actually comparing Trump to Reagan, but that's, again, offensive to, to other conservatives who don't see it that way at all, especially in the sense of decorum. Because whether you agreed with Reagan or not, he certainly had a lot of respect for the office and condu conducted himself in a way that I don't really think can be compared to Donald Trump's presentation. Um, but, you know, how, again, how all that's going to play out. I, I, I think there's an argument to be made that both parties are rewriting their histories right now in a way that you haven't seen in a really long time. Even at a time when demographics really favor Democrats, right? I mean, there are a couple of, if we didn't know who was running, on the one hand, we would say it's very unlikely for a Democrat to win a third term in the White House. And on the other hand, we would say that the changing demographics in America really favor the Democratic Party. But what that means in this year when so much has happened that's unexpected, we can't say. Mm -hmm. um, Ernst Kernmeyer of ORF, Austrian TV and radio. Um, the fact that the two candidates have so high unfavorables, what does it mean for the campaign? Uh, is it a race for independence, or is it more a race uh, to expect for, uh, for the core party followers? And the second question, um, that Donald Trump is now reaching out for the, for the Sanders followers very strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that's a, a successful, successful strategy? You'd have to think no, but yet, I, ha I mean, I, ha I haven't been able to measure that. But you do hear Sanders supporters, again, say they would vote for Trump before they would vote for her. Will they still feel that way in November is the question we can't answer. And as to whether they'll, this is a turn out the base election or a go for independence election, I don't know that those have been the two models, right? Either you strongly, you just t try to turn out every last member of your own party. You really, the thinking has been you still can never win the White House without getting some crossover votes. Um, I think that they'll both be going for those crossover votes. And because of the perceived toxicity of both candidates, they'll both get some crossover votes. I mean, this is going to be the most mixed up <laughs> election we can think of. So I don't think it's, it's going to be an appeal to independence in the usual sense of both trying to be very moderate. I think it's going to be a high decibel, high anger, high, um, uh, an election fueled by fear, actually, uh, on all sides and, and over the Supreme Court. You know, don't with the pitch being, don't you fear the Supreme Court of this candidate or this candidate? But I, it, 
it will be based on those crossover votes and bringing potentially on Trump bringing new people into the system. I don't think Hillary, anyone thinks Hillary Clinton will bring new people into the voting booth. Should we do New York, please? Uh, good morning. Um, Hajime Matsuro of Japan, Sanke. Um, you mentioned, you described uh, Trump as a chameleon. A chameleon. Um, so could you put it yourself in uh, his shoes? Why did he, uh, in, um, from the beginning, um, um, decided to run as a Republican, not as an independent or Democrat? I could never. Good question, if I may, excuse me. Sure. Excuse me, second question. Um, U.S. media media has been criticized, even by the president, for over portraying um, Trump. Um, uh, do you think that claim stands well? I'll start with that. Uh, yes, I think that it is. Well, first of all, when people say the media, you know, that means a lot of different things. So I don't really like being thrown in with you know, cable shows that are running every single word out of Donald Trump's mouth because that's not what I do. So all media is not created equal. It also r rubbed me the wrong way to hear the president um, telling us about how important it is to do, uh, you know, meaty journalism when I see this administration trying to keep the American press from doing meaty journalism. So I'll just say that. On the other hand, yes, uh, Donald Trump started with 100% practically name ID, and I think it was very unfair. You've never seen another race in which every single uh, speech the man gave was run in its entirety on cable television. I think that gave him a crazy advantage. So, and it, of course it was for ratings. So I do think that, that some of the criticism is warranted, yes. And I forget what the first question was. Oh, why is he? Why did he put myself in his shoes? Uh, so I cannot put myself in Donald Trump's shoes. Um, but uh, he has said that he has, and we know that he has donated to people in both parties as a businessman. And he has definitely, if you believe nothing else from Donald Trump, we can believe that that's how business gets done. And he has certainly, you know, shown shown that to be true. Um, his his views, I, I don't know the, how his views have developed, but his views do seem to mostly be uh, democratic with, uh, with the exception of his views on immigration and on trade. So both the Republican and the Democratic parties are much more free trade than he is. Um, so, you know, which again mixes up the alliances, but um, I, I can't really say why he decided to be, to run as a Republican or to register as a Republican. He, again, with the exception of those two issues, sounds more like a Democrat. Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Lauri Tankler with the Estonian Public Broadcasting. Um, I have another media question. You, um, uh, with, uh, with your outlet, Roll Call, um, mostly focused on, on Congress, uh, um, what's your strategy going to be, you know, come this fall um, in, this, in the terms of how to cover uh, the, the races? Is it mostly going to be focusing on, on the Senate being, you know, maybe in play, or, or are you focusing on the question of, of how to cover Donald Trump without, uh, you know, uh, w without that sort of excess uh, that uh, has been uh, attributed to the media uh, until now? Well, I think on the other hand, on the other side of that equation, to ignore the Trump phenomenon would, you know, that's, that, it's one of the most interesting stories of, of you know, our lifetime. Uh, and the most surprising. I mean, as a print journalist, you're not, it's just a completely different situation. So we wouldn't 
be in the situation of deciding whether or not to run the whole speech and you know we would be reporting on him and every other candidate critically so I don't really feel that that an excess is a problem um, although I'm sure some would disagree with me I think I mean roll call really covers Senate and congressional races in a way that other outlets typically don't so and and those two stories are quite connected as we're talking about today so how Trump does will affect the down ballot races so there it's it's not you can't write about one without writing about the other but we will continue to focus very strongly on the down ballot races so we do New York for the final question please um, hello, Argemino Barro from uh, Capital Radio uh, in Spain. Uh, it seems to me that somehow this phenomenon in the United States this year, polarization, has happened in Europe. Uh, similarly, in the past few years, populism movements in, uh, in the South, left wing, in the North, right wing, the UK, France, Germany, and so on. So my question is, do you think that Donald Trump incarnates the same phenomenon, like after the recession, people is frustrated? And most importantly, given like the cases in Europe, do you think, like, I mean, did anybody like um, uh, forecast it, forecast or expected like the phenomenon in the U.S. saying like, look, salaries are being down, uh, economy, yeah, you know, we're creating employment, but it's like less quality, people is very angry to the parties. We can have the similar phenomenon as in Europe. Did anybody like think of that like a year ago? Thank you. A year ago, and I have just been looking back at things I was writing about a year ago. A year ago, we were saying oh, this is going to be an election over inequality. Poverty is going to have a focus in this race that it hasn't had in decades. So that turned out to be partly right. I mean, I think that really fueled the candidacy of Bernie Sanders. Um, as far as did people see, there has always been a lot of heat or in recent years in the immigration debate. Did anyone see that as becoming such a top tier issue? I would say in this race, I would say no. Um, but again, Donald Trump is not a politician in a purely, you know, right wing. Um, he's he's not like Marine Le Pen. He because so many of his views are in. Our, more in line with our Democratic Party. So he's not all right wing. He's kind of a, a combo plate in, in a way that w is, is not, it has elements of the influences you're talking about seeing in Europe, but it's, it's not only that. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it.